seizing on an opportunity he saw in the subscription beauty box business. Our guest, Joseph Martin, founded BoxyCharm in 2013. He employed a second mover strategy and created a variant of the established subscription box model and began offering consumers full-size products rather than product samples. His use of second mover tactics allowed him to rapidly increase revenues and with an experienced eye on the economics of his market, was able to stay profitable and self-finance most of his growth before selling his company in a 2020 transaction valued at $500 million. In this episode, we'll discuss how Yosef discovered the opportunity to improve on an existing business model, how he developed a marketing strategy to create a passionate online community and loyal subscriber base. Yosef discusses how to scale your business and align employees behind your vision. He shares what to look for in a mentor and the important skills needed to be a successful entrepreneur. Yosef, welcome to our podcast series. Thank you for having me. To begin with, why don't you start by telling the audience a bit about yourself and the journey that led you to create your company, BoxyCharm? Yeah, sure. So I came from Israel when I was around 20, 22 years old. I went to business school in the purpose of just staying legal. I didn't plan on opening a business or anything like that. I was just looking for something to do and I had no idea what. I wasn't planning on anything special. And through the process of being in business school, I started opening my first company. It was, and then I had to pay the out of state tuition. So I built my first company with a couple hundred dollars and I built this to about 10 million in sales year over year. It was like a, a story where you flip merchandise at first, truckloads of excess inventory. And during that time, I was, I would say, building my foundation as an entrepreneur because I acquired certain skills mm-hmm. that in the future helped me till today. And those skills were mostly internet marketing and kind of like taking more important decisions than your competition throughout the years. And around 2012, I ran into a situation where I heard about a subscription box through a client of mine that bought from us some products. At the time, it was Glossy Box. And at that time, my company was generating about 10 million in sales, we were selling excess inventory of makeup, along other things. And I saw some imperfections in the process, in the concept of what they're doing. And I figured I can come in as a true second mover to the space I just created, and I can make some impact and modify the business and do it better. And that, that's how it all started. What I find fascinating is speaking to people that find that bit of space, that opportunity that others are missing, and a way to do things better. Uh, One of the people that I I love to quote is Sarah Blakely. She's the founder of Spanx, and she often talks about the value of being an outsider, doing the unexpected, and not playing by the rules. Was there an advantage for you as an outsider to the beauty business and the subscription box business and the way you approach the way you wanted to do the business? Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you come from the industry, you're already molded into a box mm. and you do what everyone else is doing. So you lose the, the edge. You just don't have the outside perspective. You do not look at things outside of the box. When you come from the outside, you don't even know there is a box. Right. You, you encounter <laughs> the box while you already started a business and you look at everybody else and you see what they're doing. And one thing you do know this is that their focus is different than your focus. The idea for me was I came in knowing nothing about the beauty industry. The beauty industry was primarily in New York. That was the Mecca. Then there was the other civilization out there in Los Angeles where it was all the beauty influencers. And there are just two different civilizations that at the time didn't correlate. They did not touch each other. I came from Miami and I noticed both of those. I would say the benefits and the inefficiencies of each Hmm. And I was able to put it together. When you're an an outsider, you have knowledge of, think of a superior technology that someone else does. They just don't think of integrating that. They didn't know what it can do. And that can make miracles. And that's why you need outsiders. You look at Elon Musk coming into Tesla. You look at Elon Musk coming into SpaceX, modifying he modified the, the auto industry, modified the st- space travel. He was an outsider in every way, shape, and form, and he's taking his old knowledge, bringing it into the new world, if you may call it. That is so spot on because I, I've spoken to a variety of different entrepreneurs that look at a market space and, and, and question why do they do things a certain way? And I think that you looked at the subscription box business and your customer at the time, you saw that they were actually 
primarily utilizing samples from major brands. And they were coming to you for product because they were had to fill the box. So how did you take that little aha moment and build that into what eventually was, what, before you sold the company, almost $500 million in revenues? Yes. So we were doing full size. I think we're the, the first. Well, I, I don't want to say I was the first because there were quite a few boxes and it's not like I can guarantee that I was the first, but at least the one I've seen, right? I was the only one that focused on full size. Mm. And there are many, many reasons why, but in, in a nutshell, you have to understand looking at everything from the outside. So the beauty category is not the subscription box, the beauty subscription box category. It's a big difference. We were a layer over the beauty brand. We were not part of the beauty industry per se. We were just a subscription providing service. Imagine kind of like more of uh, Amazon, where Amazon is the marketplace for everything, right? So when I started, the category, the subscription box category was about two years old. Birchbox launched the first beauty box out there in 2010. And then and there was Ipsy, there, there's a Glossy Box, there quite a few other. And none of them truly modified the original concept of the first mover. They all pretty much asked for free samples, and they were looking for sample size. They were looking for free things, right? right. So they made money because they did not have to worry about paying for samples. Now, when I came in, I noticed two problems. So the subscription box was running into a point where everyone were doing the same thing that the original first mover, mover did, which means none of them took advantage of being a second mover. They didn't look at the space. Everyone were giving free samples sample size for free. I came in and I figured, can I create the economics so I can pay the cost of goods, the actual manufacturing cost? So no brand has to acquire a cost. But the second thing is, I want full size. Why full size? Well, because everyone already did sample size. I wanted to come up different, but what I figure, you know what? A brand hates doing sample size because it's a product development. They have to manufacture everything all over again. Just a lot of work for them. Right. If I tell them, look, whatever you already make, you don't have to. And that allowed me to selectively buy the right items at the time and all, all that. You find out when you go into the beauty industry that the, the gap between the cost of manufacturing to what they sell is roughly about 10 cents on a the dollar. There's a lot of profit in it. So I was able to provide value to the consumer. So they paid at, at first they were paying $21. Later on, we upped it to 25 But if it was 21 we were always guaranteeing over $100 in value. Always. Mm. So for the consumer, it's a great it's a great deal. For the brand, it cost them nothing because I paid the cost of goods, and I was still turning profit. And that was the, if you want to call it, the, it was around the economics first. Yes. And I was able to create a superior product to everybody else. And when you make a superior product, like a magic, they call you a genius in marketing. But you're not really because you have a better product. Right. <laughs> it can be better. So everything you do works, right? It's a, I'm sure if the product was average, maybe I wouldn't do so well, right? right? But everything works for you and it's a lot easier to build a passionate community when your product is superior. And that's where I was able to make a difference. But that didn't, it didn't happen right away. I didn't just sit down in December of 2012 and it all came to me. Absolutely not. I had one idea that I thought I'll be better marketing and I have, then I had another thing that Every time you had this modification into the product market fit, and eventually around 2016, I already knew exactly how I'm going to win this war, and we went with that. That was it, From there on, it was a complete understanding of what the problem is, but it took a while. It took a while to understand that. So let's talk about that battle plan. Here you're a new company, you're a new player to the marketplace. How did you build that community? What was your approach in order to get a critical mass of customers together where it made sense? There are two part for it, I would say. The, the first part is just built organically. And that's what happened with everybody else. And the community was just coming together because you sell something that people like and they end up talking about this. And it just happened organically. And that's what everyone else did. And it's really coming down to who has a better product, has a better community. And you can see this today too. I mean, in, in anything, right? It, if it, again, let's go back to Tesla, right? People are passionate about Tesla, but there's no actual activation for people to go and do things. That part changed for me in 2017 where I started feeling, okay, I'm on the right path. I understand how to build the right boxes. I understood that it's the eyeshadow palette revolution. Let's put eyeshadow. I knew how to compose a box every month forever and always win and always modify with what works. But I felt like the community, what I do is what everyone else is doing. So just because 
my community gets to be passionate a little bit more than the others at the time, but I figure it's just coming organic. Mm. But what do I do actually to influence it other than having good products? And that's where it changed. I was going on Facebook and I noticed this interesting part where they had Facebook groups, where the Facebook groups or Facebook forms were extremely passionate. And at that time, we didn't have big groups. We had about three groups that I noticed. And they had about between 1,000 to 3,000 people in it, but they were so engaged. And when I joined them, they weren't really looking for men, to be honest. They just wanted women that like makeup to talk about this. But they all called each other Tomers, and they were very, very advocates. Mm. Now, when they found out I'm the founder, they were very welcoming. They, they, they didn't know who I was. Of course, at the time, I was very pri- I was private. My accounts were private. I had to tell them I'm the owner of Vakitam. I just want to see the sentiment, how you guys feel about the product and the experience, if, if it's okay. And then they said, no, no, absolutely. And they were very, very welcoming. So then I decided to go and let them know before anybody else what's going to be in the box. Because every month, on the first of the month, I would have a sneak peek on Bhaktichum pages on, on Instagram and Facebook. And it was always the number one post for Bhaktichum. Every, everybody wanted to know what's going to be this month in the box. Right. And with them, I decided I'll give them the information beforehand. And I, I didn't even know what the definition of community is. So I had to Google that. Mm. And the definition of community, because I asked myself, what is a community? Like, no one ever asked him, so, did you ask yourself, did you get uncomfortable and say to yourself, I don't know how to define a community? Because if I do, maybe I can influence it even better. And the community is a group of people with the same interest in the same space activating together. So I said, all right, where is my activation? And they're all in the same space, I guess. But then you find that the community on Facebook are different spaces that you can call a space. Facebook is not a space. Instagram is not a space. But if they are talking on a particular post, now that is a space. When they're commenting that an activation, they're all activating. Right. So I figure, well, if I have those forms, let's go and give them information. Those are going to be the super charmers. Let me go and bring more people into them. This way, they're all going to be like them. And I wanted to make sure that everyone that follow Bakitam would join those forms. So I would give those forms information before anybody else. What's going to be in the box? And it just became very pervasive. Everybody wanted to figure out how the hell do they know? And then lots of people joined. And eventually I made a couple of announcements on, on boxy jump pages, which were big already. Said, if you want to know, go on those forms that we're going to find out. You know, in time, they created around roughly 100 different forms. And the bigger forms I've seen was over 90,000 people. The, all combined are hundreds of thousands of people engaging in forms and uh, fan pages on Instagram. I would consistently engage with those pages. I would consistently go live with them. I would consistently, every month I would consistent. But I would always go and create a momentum for the searches for Bakitam. So the community would always have to search for something. There was always activation for them. Kind of like the, the games that I would do it all the time. I would always hint some things and to make sure that they're going to look at my post. They're going to go and I would post something. I would throw a little hint be, uh, behind my back of what might be in the box, and right. I knew it's going to get on the forms. And eventually, I would verify on the form a month later that yes, you're right, that was it. And so it was like a scavenge hunt, which they were engaged all the time. And from 2017 all the way to 2020, when I exited the company, I was doing the same thing, and uh, those forms were highly engaged. And that's how the community was so powerful that when I wanted to launch a new box. Uh, say an upgrade for a box. Right. We had a box in 2018 that we launched, and all I did was we just uh, post on Instagram that there's going to be a box uh, that can come in, it's going to be an upgrade, $50 a month instead of 25 or 21 at the time. I did one post on Instagram on my page, and then I engaged in in couple of forms, and I told them what's going to be in it, and that's it. We didn't do anything. We told them September 1st, we're going to launch a box. On September 1st, we had, well, 175,000 people at nine a.m. clicking on the checkout page to buy. <laughs> and throughout the day, it was 250000 right? So just to put it in perspective, it was $30 million revenue, annual revenue, just from one post and one engagement on their form. That's what, it. What I love about that is you were constantly tapped into the pulse of the market. You were constantly getting feedback from consumer experience. You were constantly having your voice heard with a very large and passionate audience. To me, it reflects the power of the internet the power of focusing on your customers and engaging with them. You know, today we look at all sorts of subscription-based models and not just in the beauty business. Some examples include Blue Apron, which is selling curated meals. You've got Harry's and the Dollar Shave Club, 
which are replenishment models. And of course, there's Scentbird and Ipsy, which acquired your company in 2020. So we've seen this meteoric growth of the product subscription marketplace and many more companies finding new and unique market segments. One of the things we hear from entrepreneurs is the importance of getting new employees onboarded and having clarity of vision and of communicating that vision to the staff. Tell us about your vision and how you brought new people on board and what were the pillars of your strategy? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I guess it's two parts. One is the pillars and the strategies in general, actually. It's not just to bring people in, but then how do you bring people in? This probably was the toughest part for the business. Uh, it was more challenging than acquiring a relationship with major brands, which was very challenging. Mm. But the inexperience I had with uh, scaling an organization, you know, was felt between 2016 to 2017. I was trying to scale the organization and I just didn't have a perspective of what good is for certain positions because those positions have never filled before. All I had prior to that was a small company with 15 employees and there was a need to scale. But I think that there's a couple of things why I was able to scale it. But if I have to find the number one reason was I ultimately made a decision that instead of hiring more managers or more directors, I needed to hire from the top right-hand men that can scale the organization underneath me, someone who have done this mm. and build it from the bottom up. It was a decision that was taking a little bit of time, but if you find that that one COO slash president, in our case, it was a COO that have seen a, a growing organization from, say, 50 to 100 million to billions, which is very hard to find them, especially sure. if you're in Florida. You can't just walk around and find those people. But you have to knock on doors, you have to interview people. And those that are applying for the job, those are, those are usually the ones that don't have a job because there was a reason why they didn't have a job. So you have to pull someone out of a job. Mm. And it's not very easy for a company that was doing 50, so we started with 30 million, then quickly we made it to 50 million a year, to convince them to leave their billion dollar business, right? Mm. <laughs> like, and they had to have a very good position, but uh, we're very fortunate where we brought in the first COO and I had to bring in a few people. It didn't work out. And you know what? You kiss a couple of frogs until you find the princess because the thing was, in my case, I figured I'm not going to win by being better in finding the right person. I can absolutely win. Maybe I, I will do it and maybe I can do better than the competition does, but what I can guarantee I can win is that if that's not the right person, I'll let them go faster than my competitor. So when I'm looking for COO position and that is not the person, it's really up to me to make the decision to let go of those people so, so I can find someone else. Mm. And I felt like we did, uh, I did pretty good in that one. Eventually, my thought was, okay, how do I know the person? No one have done a subscription box at that scale except me and two other companies, um, which was Fox with Fun and Ipsy. Mm. And, uh, well, they were bigger than me at the time. And I can't pull their people. So I had to find someone else that was in a similar space. And, you know, what? e-commerce was the only space. So I brought in Eric Kao, which he was the VP of Merchandising and Operation in Chewy. Mm. Chewy just went through an exit. It was the time we found them. And the difference between us and Chewy yeah, Chewy was a much larger, larger business. However, Chewy was growing all along with, by raising money because they were losing money. They were not profitable. Mm. And they grew to about $2 billion in sales. Bakhtichan was profitable all along, which was surprising for him, and that's what intrigued him. And my vision was very, very clear of what I need. It was very easy for me around 2015 to understand what everything is. And that leads me to answer your second question, is pillars, mm. right? I understood around 2015 that either I'm going to run like a chicken with their head cut off or I'm going to have to figure out how to get everyone to align with my vision. And the way it was done was to simplify the goal. What am I looking for? What are we here for? And then how are we going to get there? So those were the pillars. The how to get there was the, was the road to the destination. The destination was your goal and the road to get there, that was the strategy. And again, I had to understand what the difference between a strategy and a tactic is. Right? Mm, yep. Easy said than done. Sometimes you have an idea, like, is that a strategy or is that a tactic? You battle yourself with that. But like, you're like, okay, let me think about it. So a strategy is a common denominator of multiple tactics. Mm. And it's still challenging to understand which one is which. But eventually, you clarify it in your head, and then you just write it very simple. So we said, 
the goal is to grow. As long as I'm profitable, I want to grow. Grow with number of members, right? And how do you grow? First, get the best product in the box. We call this content is king. Then customer experience. Then brand experience. Give them the best in class marketing campaign for free, right? And the, the fourth is influencers experience. You can't just be another brand that they work with. They got to love you. They got to fucking love you. Mm. So the first part, content is king. They can't just be okay with the product. They got to love the product. They got to be obsessed. This way, they're promoters. This way, you get yourself more promoters. You don't even have to market your business. They'll market it for you. You got to get the best product. Experience. Even if you give them the best product, but the experience sucks, they're going to leave you. And we would break down later on what it is. So think of executive summary. Mm. just tells you, we want to grow. Okay, how? Best product, best experience for the consumer, best experience for the brand, best experience for the influencers. Now, when you come down and anyone that comes to work in a company would understand what we're all about. And when they come up with an idea, you would go and hear them say, I have an idea. You would hear a coordinator saying to their managers, you would walk around the office like, it's going to hit pillar two and three. They would know exactly how to win. Everything you throw on a wall will stick. This way you have a goal-oriented business, organization, Everything you throw on the wall will stick. You just pick the one that's stuck better than anything else. So you can pierce through any challenge. Kind of like all the vectors go in one direction. You pierce through walls, right. no matter what the challenge is. Because if you have 50 brands, 50 brands know what they're going after, know what they need to do. Everyone has the self-actualization. They feel important. They know that they're important. They know what they're doing. They're not lost. In the lieu of having an officer in sight, they can make decisions. It is kind of like a superior organism that you chop their head, another head comes out. And right. that's how you can win with a small t- team of people. Right. You get everyone aligned. They, they know what the objectives yeah. are, and they, they're heading in the right direction. So, uh, All right. And when you interview someone, mm-hmm. you break it down to them. They already understand what you're all about. It is a lot easier to hire a person when they know what you're doing. Right. And then it also gives you an opportunity then to evaluate people because uh, so how are they how are they heading towards our goal? How are they contributing to the organization? So a lot of those things all play in together. I, I think it's, it's brilliant. What advice do you have for budding entrepreneurs? Listen, skills. You need to have some skills, useful skills. Uh, that's one. If you don't have any useful skills, acquire some. And it's not going to be easy. Right? You need to know the right skills. The second thing is, I noticed many people are trying to get mentors, and they go to anyone who made it, and they said, I want to be around you. And my advice is, don't do it like this. Go to something very specific to what you do. Mm. Everyone can learn a little bit about everything that's not important to their goal. And that's the problem. You take in a mentor that has nothing to do with your business, doesn't know how to. You might even take that multimillionaire that you think is your mentor and tell them, go ahead and do it, and they'll fail. Mm. You need to go... And look at your competition, what they're doing. Learn from your competition will give you a lot more than just a general mentor that doesn't know anything about your business. It's going to be much more precise. This is the only way for you to actually learn, right? And sometimes your competitor can be your mentor just by making friends. You'll be surprised. So stop thinking that going to any seminars, listening to high-level people that made some money and now they want to brag and talk about what they did. Like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm more inspired. Enough with inspiration. Inspiration should be no more than 5% of your time. 95% of your time should be specifically to what you do. That's great. That's precisely great. to what you do. Yeah, that, that's, that's what you get to focus on. That's great advice. And, and also acquiring skills. And, it, and by the way, within acquiring skills, as I tell people, understand the language of finance, understand the economics of your business, and then really dig down and immerse yourself in your business. Those are all important characteristics you need to be successful. Look, if you're not a skilled person in your business, very quickly, you might get lucky by having few one or two employees that figure it all out and they're kind of like wearing multiple hats and they can do it all. But I've seen this in companies that scaled, actually, and that did very well. But when the founders either kind of like distance themselves from the day-to-day because they feel like now I'm a big CEO and, it's, and because they hear all those advices that let other people do it, trust the system. No, you need to know mm. your business. You do need to know your business. I would always go back to my events and I can go and break it down. And then later on, I look at other companies that were in my space that were doing it different and poorly. And you can see how it comes down to the fact that when you don't have the poll, you don't have any more the understanding of what the business is all about. You don't know what good is. So you can hire a person. Look, think of of a data scientist. I needed to hire a data scientist. Mm. 
to my organization. At first, I didn't have a data scientist, so I had no idea what good is. And we were trying to find one. It was hard because we're competing with Amazon and, and Google. And data scientists don't know that BoxyCharm is the coolest brand in the beauty industry at the time or whatever in a subscription space. So we had one guy, and I couldn't really understand what the heck he's talking about. So he would break down Ruby Cube in seconds, and I would think he's a genius and he has a PhD and all that stuff. But eventually, it was the biggest fiasco the company had was because of him, because he couldn't really figure out the business. It was horrible. Eventually, I hired a real rock star that came in, did an amazing job. I don't want to say amazing job. It was a re- transformed the business. Hmm. But once you see what good is, you'll forever know the difference between a rock star engineer that can solve a problem that 100 basic engineers can solve, that would give you the perspective, right? Right, right. What happens when you don't understand your own business is that you're going to be only hiring the good ones if you're lucky. Right. Most likely, you're going to run you through so many walls because you don't know that the person you have is not good. And that's why you need to be proficient. Proficiency helps you. You need to be proficient in many things. It's not easy, but you have to do it. Right. Because Interesting. Because you... Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things you're saying, though, is that somebody could look good, but they're not the right fit. They really don't understand your business as you do. It's going to be your job to make sure they understand the business. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, imagine if I have 150 employees, they would all understand the business to the granular level because it's easy to understand right. the business. But then someone comes and he doesn't understand the business. And those can be highly intelligent people, but they just don't get your business. Exactly. Then, okay, then he's not going to be here. I know I convey my message well because I have already 150 people mm-hmm. making autonomous decisions in their space, in their category. They don't need me. You're the one that couldn't figure it out. Right. So I understand that it's never going to be 100%, no matter how well you're going to convey the business. And sometimes it's going to be the Harvard graduates or the, that are just, they're not there, right? And not all the time, right? It can be from anywhere, but it can also be there. So sure. that's the, it's going to give you perspective. Yosef, what one word describes who you are? One word? I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a tough question. Why don't you answer me yourself one word that describes you so it will give me an idea? I am forever curious. All right. I'm intense. Then I'm intense. I'm, a, I'm an intense person. Okay. Yeah. So it's intensity that really speaks of who Very you much, are. Yeah. Ah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that comes through, by the way, as we're talking about your business. Certainly, I get that yeah, intensity. For- I'm more intense when it comes down to business because I'm very worried about momentum. Mm-hmm. I feel like the momentum is where you do not have to have the perfect product. You can be average on your execution. You just need to perfect the momentum. Right. This is where intensity comes, right? It is going to be about the momentum and the product, right? Just get the momentum and the product. Then the execution can be a little bit less than good. So that's why I'm intense because momentum requires intensity. So I'm intense. That's why. Got it. Yosef, thank you so much for participating in our podcast series. I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. Thank you. Matt, thank you for having me and looking forward to hearing myself speaking. (laughs) If I really have an accent or not. (laughs) Thanks again. (laughs) Thank you very much. During our discussion, Yosef talked about the benefits of being an industry outsider, unlike an insider who has an extensive industry knowledge and is engaged in the business. An outsider has the advantage of not knowing conventional approaches and can apply a fresh perspective. For an outsider, the right mix of transferable skills allows you to adapt quickly. Think outside the box, so to speak. Yosef uses Elon Musk's entry into Tesla and SpaceX as examples of how an outsider can rethink and reshape an industry. Before starting BoxyCharm, he looked at the companies in the subscription box business selling beauty products and found most were just copying the first mover's business model. No one appeared to be taking an innovative approach. To start his business, Yosef changed the strategy from sample size to full size products and developed a strategy with several core elements. First, by closely examining the economics, he recognized giving away free samples was not sustainable and was costly for brands to support. Instead, he saw the significant margins for full-size products as an opportunity to guarantee customers considerable value above his subscription price. Next, he needed to foster a passionate community on social media and engage with consumers. Here, Yosef defines a community as a group of people 
with the same interest in the same space, activating together. In this context, activating is about taking action in a journey from discussion and engagement to recognizing value to becoming a customer. He saw the power of personally participating in Facebook forums and groups, thus fueling the growth of the company's online community. He went on to develop an integrated marketing and service program focused on creating an exceptional experience for customers, brands, and influencers. We discussed scaling his business and onboarding new employees and the importance of having a clear vision and strategy to align their actions. Joseph mentioned the importance of simplifying your goal and defining the steps or tactics within a strategy to reach your objective. His advice to budding entrepreneurs is to have a diverse skill set. These include being a good listener and having a deep understanding of your business at all levels. This will help you as your business grows and you need to scale up. As he said, you need to be proficient in many things. It's not easy, but you must do it. He suggests that when you look for a mentor, find someone familiar with your industry and market. They are likely to provide the best advice since they understand the elements of being successful in your business environment. And when asked for the one word that describes him, Yosef said intense. This speaks to being passionate, competitive, and tenacious in pursuit of your objectives. We thank Yosef for sharing his experiences and valuable insights. This podcast is executive produced by John Rebecki and New York Institute of Technology in conjunction with the School of Management and the Office of Strategic Communications and External Affairs. The interim dean of the School of Management and executive producer of this podcast is Deborah Cohen. Our marketing and social media strategist is Petra Shantaraga, and our audio editor and mixer is Brian Falk from Abacus Entertainment. Special thanks to Professor Ellie Schwartz and Victoria Greco for all their support. Until next time.